In today's video, I'll be talking about rule number one of the rules of the road. The name of this rule is application. Now, just like I have done with all my other videos, I will explain each part of this rule. Uh, I will not necessarily read out the rule. The rule will be there on your screen. Uh, and I will try to explain what each of these part refers to. All right, so you can see the rule or part A of the rule is written on top in bold letters and uh, the rules uh, say that uh, it applies to all vessels upon the high seas and in all waters connected there with navigable by sea going vessels. Now what rule number one does is it basically focuses uh, in answering the questions that uh, where and when do the uh, rules of the road apply. Uh, do these international rules apply on international waters only or do they apply only to large commercial ships or to small boats as well. In doing so, this rule makes a lot of comparison with the rules that are written for inland vessels. Now, if you don't know what those rules look like, I'll show you an example of uh, how a part B of the rule is written for international vessels as well as for uh, inland vessels. So I'll show you that. So uh, throughout these rules, there's a lot of comparison done with rules for international vessels as well as rules for uh, inland vessels. So yeah, again, in this rule, it talks about vessels. And if you don't know what vessel is, a vessel is defined in rule number three, part A. It gives a very broad definition, which includes large craft, small craft, even sailboats, seaplanes on the water, as well as military craft. Now, the older day rules uh, allowed Navy and Coast Guard vessels to actually operate in violation of the rules of the road under some circumstances uh, are no longer in effect. Now, Navy and Coast Guard vessels do sometimes operate at night without navigation lights, but in those cases, the commanding officer of those vessels assume full responsibility for avoiding collisions, and they are liable for damages resulting from their violation of the rules. Now, the international rules apply on the high seas and the connecting waters. Now, high seas waters are those which are beyond the limits of a country's territorial sea. And therefore, the inland rules in many cases may differ. Like I'll show you the inland rule for US waters and Canadian Great Lakes in the next slide. And I'll, you'll see the difference of how uh, the same rule is written for international vessels uh, and for inland vessels. All right. So the width of the territorial sea varies from country to country, of course, but 12 miles is now the internationally accepted standard. Now, even though the actual language says that international rules also apply to connecting waters, which are navigable by seagoing vessels, that requirement is often overridden by the application of paragraph B that I'll show you in the next slide. Now, in more, almost all the cases, the international rules apply on territorial waters, uh, which are the waters lying between the coastline and the high seas, and also on some inland waters, which are inside the baseline. So rivers, harbors, bays, uh, they are examples of internal waters. The U.S. internal waters to which the international rules apply include the rivers and bays of Alaska and the rivers and bays of most of Maine and some other waters. There is no one rule describing the boundary marking the limit of application of the international rules, but rather the line is set out in detail by regulation. So the lines of demarcation which divide the application of the international rules and inland rules uh, are described in a code of federal regulations. So you don't have to worry about that right now. So in most cases, the demarcation line follows the shore line. Where it doesn't, the line is laid out as a series of straight lines connecting prominent points such as lighthouses or end of the jetties. All right. Now, if you see part B of this rule, on top you see is the part B of the rule number one written for international vessels. And you see the same part B written below, as you can see the inland version, which is written for United States and Canadian Great Lakes. And you can see that in part B, which is written for inland version, is divided into two parts, part one and part two. So you can see the difference uh, in the language and the way the rules are framed when the rules are written for inland vessels. All right. So, but a legal relationship does exist between the two sets of rules. And uh, you can see that relationship is explained uh, sort of in paragraph B. Now, the international rules recognize the existence and usefulness of the, uh, the special inland rules, but admonish the navigation rules authorities to eliminate the unnecessary differences between the international and the national rules. Now, consistency, of course, minimizes confusion, errors, and the potential for collisions. Now, if you see Indian Rule 1B cites the International Rule 1B Authority for Special Rules and incorporates the International Rule Construction and Equipment Requirements as alternate provisions of the Indian Rules. 
This allows vessels complying with the international rule requirement and operating on international rule waters to enter the US inland waters without having to switch over, for example, to a different navigation light arrangement. So vessels that are operating only on inland waters may elect to comply with the international rule navigation light requirements instead of the inland rule right requirements. If they do, however, they must comply exclusively with all the international rule lights. You can't mix and match the international and inland requirements just to suit your individual needs. All right, so there's an important um, uh, gap here or a loophole here where all vessels entering the US inland waters must follow the inland rule steering and sailing rules and use the inland rule sound signals. All right, so this is where the gap is there. Now, if you look at part C again, uh, special additional station or signal lights, shapes or whistle signals are explicitly authorized by the international as well as inland navigation rules for certain classes of warships, vessels in convoy and vessels fishing in a fleet. These supplement the normal lights, shapes and signals and are not to be used to replace them. Now, if you can uh, go and look under rule number 2060, additional optional lights for vessels fishing in close proximity in a fleet are specially are separately kind of permitted under rule number 2060. All right. So this is what rule number number one C is all about. Now rule number one D is all about talking about traffic separation schemes that may be adopted by the organization for the purpose of this rules. Now what are traffic separation schemes? Uh, traffic separation schemes are defined in rule number 10 of the international rules and uh, the organization in this case is the International Maritime Organization or IMO. Uh, which is a body of the United Nations. All right, now traffic separation schemes are used to keep apart ships that are proceeding in opposite directions. And now they're usually in a well-traveled sea lanes. They, they maintain their sea lanes and they are most commonly found in the coastal approaches to busy ports around the world. Now, of course, if you have been sailing as a mariner, you must be knowing what traffic separation schemes are. All right, so as you come closer to a port, you sometimes, for example, I'll give the example of Malacca Straits. Now, as soon as you enter Malacca Straits to go into Malaysia, Indonesia or Singapore, you, you enter a traffic separation scheme for a long period of time. And in those uh, schemes, you have to follow the route. So there are routes for the uh, vessels depending on the direction of the travel. Now, in this case, international rule number 10 that applies to traffic separation scheme applies in those cases. This also goes for traffic separation schemes of the foreign coast. Now, violations of rule number 10 are reported by the country of whose coast the traffic separation scheme is located to the flag state of the vessel involved. It is then up to the flag state of the vessel's registry to educate the violation and impose any penalties. All right, so let's go into the last part now, part 1E. Now, the navigation rules have set up navigation light, shape and sound signal requirements that can readily be applied to almost all vessels that exist today. Occasionally, however, a vessel that has been designed or modified to perform a particular, perhaps a very unique function will not be able to comply fully without having its special function impaired. In those cases, rule number 1E permits a deviation from the navigation light, shape or sound signal requirements, but only to the point of preventing interference with the special function. This permitted deviation from the rules is called alternative compliance and the document granting that deviation is a certificate of alternative compliance. Vessels must fulfill two criteria before receiving a certificate of alternative compliance. First, the vessel must be of special construction or purpose. Ordinary passenger, cargo or recreational vessels do not meet this first criterion, but offshore oil and gas facility supply vessels and cable laying, cable -laying vessels will classify under the first category. Secondly, it must be shown that full compliance would interfere with the special function of the vessel. If the second criterion is also satisfied, the vessel must still comply as closely as possible with the requirements without interfering with its special function. Let me give you an example. Okay, So an example being full compliance when offshore supply vessel over 50 meters long would require the placement of an after masthead light in the middle of its long open cargo deck. However, doing this would interfere with the vessel's cargo handling function. Instead, the after masthead light is placed at the forward end of the cargo deck and the forward masthead light is placed at the stem, thereby obtaining the maximum horizontal separation possible. Although it is still less than that is specified by the rules for the international vessels. 
Now the secretary of the department in which the Coast Guard is operating makes alternative compliance determination for Coast Guard and private vessels. The authority has been delegated to the Coast Guard. So these are some of the examples in which certain alternative compliance determinations are made. All right. So I hope that you have understood each part of this rule. And if not, then let me know in the comment section which part was not very clear to you. I try to keep these videos short to hold your attention and at the same time describe the essential bits of the rule. Otherwise, you can keep talking about each part of the rule. There is no end to it. So as long as you understand the basic concept of the rule, you get a good understanding. You will be able to answer the questions that are asked to you in the examinations as well as from a practical application point of view. Uh, but I do recommend that you read more and more and learn more and more about each part if time permits. All right. Otherwise, this is a good video to listen to before you just go in for your oral examination. I'll see you soon with my next video, guys. Keep studying hard and let me know what you think about these videos. Bye.